Copywriting is using words to make a sale. So if you're talking to me, for example, now and I always give the example of adverts. And the thing is that we don't think about it. What's the most popular advert in the world? We talk about Coca-Cola. They've got all kinds of adverts. And when you see the adverts, the next thing, what's the next thing you want to do? You want to buy Coke. No like trust factor. Let people get to know you. Let them know you first. And then when they like you, then they trust you to buy from. I mean to buy from you. So that would just be my suggestion for small business owners. A copy, a good copy would have a fantastic headline, a catchy headline. So sometimes when you look at uh, 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 our, our content online, you see some very outrageous headline. Copywriters use that to get people's attention. The idea of the headline is to get people to look in that direction. author of the storytelling series for small businesses and content creators. In Obehi Podcast, we talk about the power of your story, your narrative, and why you should own your voice. Whether you are a small business owner, a content entrepreneur, or you simply want to build your influence, storytelling is probably going to be your best instrument to connect with your audience. So join the awakened few who are owning their voices. And let's get started with today's episode. Okay, so my name is Abraham Oyemari. Um, I am a father of two. Um, I'm married to a medical practitioner. I'm based in South Africa, even though I'm Nigerian, but I'm based in South Africa and uh, I work in the edu- education industry. As a, Well, I don't work full-time. I work as a part-time lecturer at one of the colleges where I skill um, learners. When I say I do upskilling, it's for people who didn't finish secondary school and they are already working in maybe business or they are working in a call center and they need upskilling. They already know it, but they don't just have the certificate to back what they are doing. So I come in, I have trainings with them, teach them already what they know and score them. So when they pass the test that they've done, that we can give them a certificate of competency to say you are competent in this act. Uh, So that is the key thing I do. I'm also a copywriter, um, a content creator. Uh, I'm also a consultant for Amazon ebook publishing uh, and a consistency coach. I run a consistency challenge on LinkedIn um for people who have challenges trying to show up on linkedin on a daily basis to show what they can do you know a lot of people don't know how to manage their time so i run a consistency challenge called the link pro link link meaning linkedin pro professional so link pro uh consistency challenge and we run it for 20 days uh, right now there's one we're doing that started on july the 9th and it will end on the 26th of, sorry, the 28th of July. Uh, so for 20 days, we work with only 25 people where we will tell them about LinkedIn growth strategies, everything we know about LinkedIn optimization, your profile and all those things. And we give them something we call a content calendar to help them plan their activities for you know the entire 20 days, but we do it in batches. And then, you know, when they go online, then they engage, you know, you get feedback from people, they get leads, they get sponsored, they, sponsors, they get gigs. So the whole point of being consistent is bringing yourself out so that people can see you. So I do that as well. Uh, I also do that for room money. 
uh, same this this uh, the same thing. You know, people who want to be consistent and want to show other users what they are doing and probably get LinkedIn jobs or gigs as freelancers. Yeah. Then I run. A, I used to do that uh, full time in 2021, but now uh, I only do it when I have the time. I have a school, an academic, uh, an academy. Sorry, where I teach people about copywriting. You know, yeah. teach them what is all about what they need to do you know get them started so that when they come out they can actually become copywriters but it involves a lot of work but the starting point is to learn what copywriting is so i also do that as well yeah those are the things i do thank you so much for that uh uh oh yeah mari but where is that part from in nigeria um so <laughs> okay um very interesting story because my parents, God bless them, um, I'm from Delta State, from Agbo. And um, so we, would, we wouldn't call ourselves Igbos, you know, there's a Delta Igbo. So my father is from uh, Agbo and the surname is Onyemari. Uh, my late mom is from Bauchi State, you see. I don't know where they met. I think they said they met in Lagos. So, yeah. So I've got northern cousins. I don't really even know. You know, I've got I know more of myself uh, the ones from the south, but from the ones from the north, I don't know them that well because I didn't really interact with them so much there. But yeah, so the surname you could call it Delta Ibu. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for that. If You're you didn't tell me, I would just uh, claim me to be an Asian name. It looked very Asian. So, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. so, we're not far from, we're not too far apart. I am from Urumi, which is Asa, and Asa okay. is not far away from Agbo. Of course, it if isn't. you look at the, the old uh, uh, Benin Empire now, or looking at the old Benin State, we were all together in one. Yes. So, uh, it's possible that we have uh, missed out somehow because the name looked very, very ace. <laughs> anyway, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for, for the sharing. That, that's my brother. All right. So tell me a bit about that, uh, Oye Mari. So when did you, uh, what do you, what do you remember about your childhood growing up? Okay. Now I'm saying that because, um, here in Obehead podcast, we are sort of, uh, are very keen on story. We love story so much. And so okay. we talk about our origin, where we are coming from, who we are, before we talk of what you do. So give me the privilege of understanding you as you were growing up in data states. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, I grew up in Benin. So if we want to speak to Pichi, that one not hard. I grew up in Benin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for I think my first six or seven years, then my father used to work in Union Bank those days. They used to call it Barclay, Barclays Bank. I'm not so sure. But yeah, uh, so they now transferred him from, from Benin to Lagos. So I was born in Benin. My, we're in a family of four, three boys and a girl, and the girl is the youngest. And I am the second of everything. So the second boy and the second child. So my, me and my elder brother, I think even my even the third, my younger brother, were all born in Benin. But uh, when my father got some transfer or promotion, we had to move to Lagos. My sister was born in Lagos. So there was a time we couldn't even speak English properly because all we knew how to speak was pidgin. Everything I do, do, sorry, oh, do, do, you know. <laughs> so my parents didn't really like it because, you know, they wanted us to speak proper English. And when we came to uh, to Lagos, and they enrolled us in a private school, Maryland Convent Private School at uh, Maryland um, back in the day. They, there was a band that we don't speak any other language besides English. Now, it does have its good part and it does have its disadvantage. The disadvantage is that because my parents are from two different ethnic groups, I didn't pick either one of them to speak. So I'm that type of child, you know who didn't really speak a dialect growing up. I do understand more of my father's, my mother, yes, but it was English that we spoke at home. So if there was anything I could change in my childhood, it would have been my parents emphasizing more that we should have learned at least one of the local dialect. 
Right now, I'm married to my wife is Yoruba, so I ensure that she speaks Yoruba to my children. I understand and speak it fairly well. So at least we're dealing with the language situation. Um, so, but growing up as a child, and I was talking to my wife this morning when I was taking her to work, but children no longer sit down and read books because that's the era I grew up in. You know, when you go to school, we come back, it's community, we play, we have fun, everybody goes outside. There's a lot of outdoor, uh, outdoor activity. You know, everybody knows each other, neighbors, we're all hanging around each other, but and we love to read books. So I remember coming back from school and either reading Easy Goes to School, the Macmillan books, all different series, would read them. And then when we go to school, we share what we learned and all those lovely stories that we used to read. So my childhood was fun. It was really, really fun. I wish our generation of children could have what we had. You know, there were no mobile phones or, you know, no internet at that point in time. So the only way we could engage ourselves was to, you know, tell stories, you know, play. Um, yeah. And tell more stories. So I, Childhood for me, Tales by Moonlight was a show I used to love watching, you know, the traditional Chinua Achibis. Um, what is it now? Oh, I forget it. Peter, Peter Doce at, acted it. Things fall apart, yes. In, yes, those were the shows we used to love watching growing up, you know. Um, the Wallace Incas, I used to love reading a lot of his poetry. Uh, I think when I was in secondary school. But yeah, I'm a book lover. I love to read. That's all we had then. We only had ourselves to play, and then we had books to entertain us. Yes. So that was my childhood. Kind of boring. <laughs> not boring at all it's full of knowledge it's full of opportunity to learn and you learn a lot <laughs> yeah. that's really very interesting you know um now i'm doing a series about the life and legacy of prominent uh, nigeria and of course also the african diaspora uh, yesterday okay. uh, we published uh, uh, one of the video which have to do with uh, dr nadia zikiwe looking at the founding fathers of nigeria Okay. Uh, so currently, I'm uh, researching and writing the script for uh, the life and legacy of, of the of the five code plotters in Nigeria, which is talking of uh, the, the death of the, the first prime minister, Tafawa Balewa, and of course, all those uh, young general who plucked Nigeria into where we are today, uh, for yes. good or for bad. Uh, we try to learn about them, so uh, we might not need to repeat the same situation. So one of the yeah. things I was actually reflecting on yesterday, uh, really through an uh, article to be able to update myself about this information, was the Nigerian national identity. Yes. Uh, and of course, one of the things I also kept to my mind was the language. Uh, what role does language play if we were to talk of the, the identity that we are supposed to have as a people? Because yes. anyway, I'm, I'm bringing this up because you were talking of proper English before, no? Uh, because it happened to me, it happened to a lot of people. I remember one time I was interviewing a professor uh, from Benin Republic, but he's uh, teaching in the United States. So he okay. told me how when he was going to school, he was flogged for speaking the local dialect uh, because he needed to speak the official language. And, and of course, looking at it from afar, you might not think there is anything wrong in that. But later, you will come to understand, of course, if you are conscious of what it meant to be, um, of, or what culture mean, then you will come to understand that that, that is a huge error. So I was yes. saying uh, yesterday, uh, of course, talking to myself, that why could we, we for example, pick either one of the languages uh, in Nigeria uh, to be our official language as we are preparing? I'm seeing maybe uh, in the 1950, 1955, 1956, 1957, moving toward 1960 now because now we are mm -hmm. constructing our identity as a people. What would be our language? What would be our culture? What do we have to do with uh, with all this Emian, the Oba, and the Igwe? What role are they supposed to play? Are we supposed to integrate them into the system? Are we supposed to abolish them? Are we supposed to live side by side with them? Who do we bear our allegiance to? Mm. All this was will have all needed to be identified, needed to be clearly defined for the people who we call themselves Nigeria. Uh, because take it or leave it, they have a strong impact on our identity. For yes. example, you see, uh, the United States they speak English. They were colonized yes. uh, by the British. They could speak 
uh, the British English, quite uh, frankly, they didn't have any problem with that. But they still have to uh, form their own English. Um, you see, Australia, they speak English too, but their yeah. English is different from the English that is spoken uh, in Britain. Uh, in New Zealand, they speak English. Uh, even South Africa, where you are, they speak English. Uh, in, in that, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the language that we speak is very important. In that, we should yeah. be the owner of this language uh, so that it becomes something that we can be proud of as a people. Because right, right now, currently as a stand in Nigeria, we say we speak the British English, but we are not British. We are Nigerians. Uh, okay, then we also we also write American English. Is it? But we don't. You, there is no language you can actually call. This is Nigeria language. You see. We. Uh, I stand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please to go. You there. I stand to correct you that we do have our mm -hmm. own indigenous English, which is Pidgin English. Mm -hmm. which I was sharing with someone the other day how hilarious it was because you know it's the common 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 man's language you know anybody who doesn't understand Queen's English or British English can at least you know speak the Nigerian pidgin English which has become very very popular it's not actually correct when we look at grammar but it's you know, as a people, it's our mode of expression, it's who we are. It's a way to communicate. It's the best form of communication because it's raw. It is it is indigenous to Nigerians. I do know they also speak uh, pidgin in Cameroon, uh, but that pidgin is really weird if you ask me. And I'm not trying to jab anybody or throw stones, but we do have, we do have a language that I'm, for me, coming from, someone who is not in Nigeria, they always talk about our Pidgin English. When they talk about our English, they are referencing our Pidgin English because they know it's not English. But, you know, when we speak it, we understand each other. You know, we incorporate, we, we pick, pick some elements from English to, we coin some English words, you know, or Pidgin words from the English vocabulary to make it indigenous, to make it our own. So in that sense, I disagree with you because, um, of course, we said we've got three um, languages, official languages, but there's one unifying factor of those three languages is that the Igbo man, the Yoruba man, and the Hausa man, even the Bibios and the others, yeah, yeah. can't speak Pidgin. And you will agree with me. It's a lingua franca that everybody identifies with. Thank you for that uh, for pointing that out. Uh, actually, that is what I, I was proposing in my in my reflection. Okay. Uh, in that uh, since uh, in Nigeria all of us can speak Pidgin English, why do we why don't we have it as an official language? Of course, yes. making it official meaning that we are going to have to study the language, identify uh, what are what are what do we need in this language? How should it grow as a language? Because in Nigeria, uh, it, it it should be that. When a Nigerian speak, another Nigerian understand it. That is the language. It is nothing more than that. That, that is that true. We, we have our own way of expressing our feeling that we can understand it. But up until now, even among the Nigerians official, uh, the Pidgin English is looked upon as a peasant language, a language for on the uneducated people. Which so is not we, true. <laughs> then we have the language of the class. Because I've never seen... Uh, uh, our our parliamentarian, for example, debating in the Pidgin English. Uh, they don't go to the United Nations and speak in Pidgin English. If they have to meet other people, they don't speak in Pidgin English. Yeah. If I, I live in Italy, for example, up until okay. recently, okay, talking of a few hundreds of years ago, uh, there were also different languages in Italy. It was uh, the country was amalgamated. They they okay. pick one of the languages uh, okay. that become their official language. Of course, not everybody in Italy knew how to speak. Uh, no, knew how to speak this language that they pick, I think, from CNN. Uh, but okay. of course, they have to uh, uh, formulate law that make it that this one language become the official language of Italy. And of course, yes. they have to study it, uh, remodify it. The, every other language was not really abolished. The language still exists, but yeah. all the, the, la the only language that appeared in the official document across the country, late and breadth of this country, is the Italian language, which is the one they have picked. Because it, we cannot say it's not relevant. It is relevant. It is fundamental. Absolutely. In that when you give birth to a child, the child should start speaking this language from the beginning, learning, using this language to uh, 
to solve mathematics, using yeah. the language to understand the concept of God, using yeah. this language to understand what is called negotiation, business, yeah. storytelling. Yeah. If you start doing this from when you are a child, by the time you grow up, you become a monster of the language. And when you yes. need to express yourself, you are not like having any difficulty. Or like what we have today, where are we speaking in American English? Anyway, I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you completely, and I really endorse what you are saying. We are, should we, we should be speaking a unified language, which all of us identify with. Um, pigeon should be it. I do not know if it's going to happen in our generation because you know what they say about habits. They die hard. They are very easy to form, but they die hard. You know, so it takes, but the conversation needs to start. And I'm happy you started that conversation. So I would love to be a part of this movement. I mean, so anything you feel I can do to support it, please let me know because I firmly believe in it as well. You know, a language should be a, a mode of expression, communication that unifies a particular entity, it, you know. And I think besides having the three uh, popularized ones, we should have one that everybody can speak and should be part. Yeah, so I agree with you. Thank you so much for that. Anyway, I'm not going to drag that argument further than that because I'm really sort of <laughs> strong on that because even when it comes to religions too, even when it comes to our culture, all across the later breadth of Nigeria, because it's a huge country, it's blessed with a lot of resources, but yes. we should not forget that the British, before they left, they left a lot of trap that we are going to fall into. But if we rewrite our history, we redefine what it means to be a Nigerian, we are yes. going to remain in this soup where we are just uh, uh, shooting ourselves on the food. <laughs> it's yes. not going to work. But for this to work, we are going to have to sit down and define what is the term of engagement in yes. Nigeria. Absolutely. Anyway, that, is, <laughs> that is just by Anyway, you know, we are Nigerians. When we meet each other, there is no way we cannot talk about our reality, where we are coming from and all of that. <laughs> all right. That now, coming back to what you do, uh, Abraham. Uh, what do you want to say about copywriting? Because in your explanation before, you said people should understand what is copywriting. What yes. is copywriting? Okay, good question. So the first thing, and most the, most of the time, the first misconception we see when we talk about copywriting is people refer it to copyrights. You know, copywriting, copyrights, the one with the R. And they're not the same thing, but the one with copyright is more popular than copywriting you know because people know that one so i i always tell people this is a, it's a point is a good point to start a point of departure so when i have my classes i always ask people what do you understand by copywriting then they'll say is it copyright you know so if they have some kind of understanding of copyright then i can say okay fine this class is going to be very in interesting you know because the first thing to do is to dismantle uh, the myth in terms of the nomenclature the name so copywriting is not the type of copy when you go to the photocopy i always tell people and make a copy even though you hear the word copy, that's not what it is. But copywriting is using words, like we're having a conversation right now. And, you know, we talked about language and we talked about how we should have a unified um, unified language to, to, to speak as one mode of identity. Now, as a copywriter, and you said, when I was talking with you, we were having a discussion and you gave some compelling points, yeah? So copywriting is using words, like you were talking to me and I was listening to you and I was like, okay, Obehi is saying things I understand, I relate to. Um, copywriting is using words to make a sale. So if you're talking to me, for example, now, and I always give the example of adverts, and the thing is that we don't think about it. What's the most popular advert in the world? We talk about Coca-Cola. They've got all kinds of adverts. And when you see the adverts, the next thing, what's the next thing you want to do? You want to buy Coke, you see? Or, <laughs> or they talk about an advert of a car, you know, and they show you this beautiful video of somebody driving the car it's looking luxurious you know the ac is blowing everything is looking nice you know the touch 
uh, buttons are working, everything. You have that feeling of, oh, I want to buy a car. I need to buy this car. So the aim of copywriting is to get a sale out of you. It can be, what's that word? And I want to be very uh, choosy at the right selection of words. It can be a bit, um, uh, when you go after somebody, it can be a bit aggressive because that's what they want. They just want a sale. They're not interested in anything else. So copywriting is using words to make sale. So, and it is the best form of sales you can think of because you really don't have to talk. You just have to let your writing do the talking for you. Now, most people say, but isn't that writing? If it is writing, then everybody can write. We said, no, copywriting is a special type of, it, that's why it's a skill that stands on its own. Is it? Is a special type of writing that uses persuasive words to get your audience to do something. And in most cases, you want them to buy something. Okay. Now, if it's at the end of the day, well, do they need it or they don't need it? That's a discussion or argument for a different day. But the whole point of copywriting is using words to get people to make a sale or to buy something from you. I'm just trying to make it very, very easy. In fact, uh, before I started this conversation, uh, the the idea I was having in my head was to um, make you to help me understand what is meant by a good copywriting. Okay, there are a lot of copywriting out there. There are a lot of people talking about copywriting. Yes. But how you describe a good copywriting? What does it mean to you? Okay, you say, okay, first of all, you know, copywriting, uh, I did say initially is that we use words to make sales, okay? Now, a, uh, when you create that structure, you know, the writing itself, we call it a copy, a copy. And no matter how many you create, it's always singular. So copy is always copy. Even if it is 10,000, it is always copy, but not copies. It's always copy. So um, a good copywriter should be able to present a copy that converts. When we talk about conversion, it means by the time people finish reading it, and if all if the city which is called to action says, click this link now to get your order or something, everybody's clicking it. So that type of copy will convert. We say a good copywriter is one who writes copies sorry, who writes a copy that converts. So a copy will be the structure of the write-up that you've written, yeah? Uh, there's also, when we talk about copy, what is good and what is bad, yeah? A good copy, the structure should have a headline, yeah? It should have, um, instead of talking about features, okay, let me go very, very practical with you now. For example, um, if I want to date a lady, there are certain things that will attract me to that lady. So you look at things like her features, and the features will be like, is she beautiful, smiles, probably the figure, maybe the hair, you know, the facial features. Those are features. But what is, now when I want to create a copy, my emphasis will not be on, oh, look at this lady, she's beautiful. No. That's not what I want to sell, sell to you. What I want to sell to you is if you have this woman, and we are not looking at the features, we are not looking at the concept of womanhood. If you have this woman, you have, maybe she should be able to bear you children, you know, with her, you can have the opportunity to, to create wealth. You see how I've shifted from she looks beautiful to what, what is the benefit of having that woman in your life? So a copy, a good copy would have a fantastic headline, a catchy headline. So sometimes when you look at uh, uh, our, our content online, you see some very outrageous headline. Copywriters use that to get people's attention. The idea of the headline is to get people to look in that direction. Uh, so a headline must be there. It must have it must emphasize the benefits of what you are offering. It must talk about a product. It must talk about a solution. And then it must talk about what 
if if what you're saying is this is a problem i can provide the solution then the benefit has to be there as well and then a call to action you know is important because you have to tell people what to do people read and yeah what am i supposed to do after reading you know you tell people what to do so a good copy should have a you know a catchy headline because you want to stop people from mindless scrolling because that's what happens and the only way to stop people is to use a catchy headline yeah. some people can say use the how to headline some people can say use the discovery headline there are all kinds of options that one can use but it starts with the headline and once they can read that first headline you want them to get to read the next line so each objective of each line is carefully structured out in such a way that when you read the first you want to read the second go to the third you know until you get to the end so a good copywriter should know how to create a copy that converts at the end of the day when i finish reading maybe there are 10 lines and i get to the 10th line and the 10th line is saying okay book your slot now or download a copy now or click here or pay here, I should be clicking. You see, that is a good copy. And at the end of the day, maybe if you're expecting to have maybe 10 people, you end up having like 50 people because of the way it was structured. Another very important thing that should be in that copy is we should use stories because stories, people relate to stories. So, and the funny thing with stories is that you may not know what the copywriter is doing. They get your attention with the story, but at the end of the day, they are trying to get you to do something and they are using an emotional trigger of using stories to get you, to get you to understand that there is a need here. So you were talking about uh, a story. That, that's really very important. Like I said before, here in this podcast, we are heavy. We are very heavy on story because we love it so much. Okay. Now, uh, what is the role of story in copywriting? And how do you personally use story in copywriting? Help us understand that. Okay, you see, stories, you know, the thing when we talk about human beings, one thing that connects us is our stories. We like to talk about people identify, it's an emotion. So people identify with your story. Like when we started this conversation, you know, I, you asked me to tell you a bit of my childhood and you picked up certain elements you understood from it. And if I could use this expression, you and I had like a connection. We're able to, you were able to see a side of my growing up, you know, that you could identify with. So when we talk about storytelling in, in copywriting, the first thing is to try and connect with the audience. What stories do you want to use? It's an emotional trigger. You can forever, you, you can, for, for instance, use it to talk about uh, an emotion, for example, like fear. And people can relate to fear. When you talk about the story of somebody being broke, nobody likes to be broke. But if you start a story of one Mr. Easy and you talk about how he struggled, you know, you, you, you draw people in by talking about it, how he struggled to make ends meet, maybe the family background, you know, things like that. People relate to that because it's something that we all know. We, we all know a certain AZ who struggled. We all know a certain AZ who, after struggling, hit a jackpot at some point and became something because either he persevered, he persisted, he was persistent or he did something. So stories are very, very important because it's easy to break barriers talking through stories. If I don't talk about the story and I come guns blazing and tell you, hey, Mr. Obi, buy this product, right? You're gonna ask me why. But if I say, Obi, how you do? Uh, you know what? You get one story one I want to share with you, you understand? You know it's in the happen. Then you sit down, you're more relaxed. You know, the barriers are broken. You want to listen to that story. You may not know what I want to tell you, but I, as a copywriter, I know where I'm reading you. So stories are very, very important because they, 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 they are emotional triggers and they connect you to the audience. So yes, that's for me the most important thing. So if I'm going to write a copy, I need to look for a story um, now it depends, is it true or false? That is neither here nor there. But try as much as possible to be authentic. That's what I tell my students. Whatever stories you are relating to your audience, 
it may not be yours, but if you know somebody that it has happened to, it makes when you write it more believable. Don't make up stories. They have to be genuine and they have to be authentic. Like, for example, I think um, when Hida ba Basi, you know, was doing the cookout, the cooker song, and she won, you see, everybody started talking about it because everybody can identify when you are looking for something and what you need to do to get to where you are. You see, so people's stories, very rich. It's something we can always use to connect with the audience. So I tell people, use it, use it well. I don't know if you want to spend some time talking about the business side of copywriting, because now if somebody is uh, writing copy, of course, like you already have pointed out, uh, one of the primary uh, purpose of the writing is to have a say or to uh, convert at the end of the day. And yes. since uh, uh, our small businesses or businesses are what we are concentrating here in this podcast, uh, I think people want to understand the business side of copywriting. Please help us understand that. Okay, so now the business side of copywriting, if you are a small um, business owner, how, okay, let me give a simple analogy. How do you get people to see what you are doing? I'll give you a very simple analogy. You know, growing up, it used to be very popular. I don't know if it still is. Um, the people who sell bread, and I grew up you know, more in Lagos, so we always have this bread they call like gigi bread. And, you know, you see the lady go out and she'll be saying, come and buy bread, a gigi bread, fine bread. You know, she goes out to hawk her wares. And when people hear it, you know, those who are interested will... Um, come to her and buy from her. You find out that, okay, maybe within an hour or so, she's done for the day. Um, so and you see that what she's doing is she's just walking from street to street and just all she has are her products and her voice. So her voice calls on the people, yeah, and then she has the product on her head. Copywriting is like that. Copywriting is how do you use what you have to get people's attention? How do you use your voice? And your voice are your words. Now, for small, a small business owner, we're not saying that you should go out and hawk bread on your head. No, that's not what I'm saying. But where are the places where you can get people's attention to say, I am selling X, Y, Z? Okay. So for a business owner, it is places like and very, very effective start with a place like your WhatsApp status, your WhatsApp status. You put your information on your WhatsApp status to let people know the type of business you are running. And if you employ the services of a copywriter, a copywriter can create something we call a copy and share it on either their, their status or share it on your status. I'm just giving an example to get people to see the products and services that you are running. But the, the most important thing is you have to know where are these people that I'm looking for? Who are my target audience? And my target audience, say, for example, um, women who are looking for small business opportunities or women stay-at-home mothers, you need to identify who they are and know where they will be located. Now, you may not be able to know these things, but a copywriter knows these things. Where do I find people who my customer or my client needs to sell this product to because you products are not just meant for everyone. And that is why we have different, you have the Coke, you have the Pepsi, you have the seven up, you have all types of drinks because each person has their own market. So knowing what you have, first of all, you need to find out who is this product meant for. And once you know who the product is meant for, then if you employ the services of a copywriter, a copywriter will sit down and ask you a series of questions. Um, how much it costs? Would you be doing anything like any discount? Um, uh, how, how, if I get clients for you, how do they reach you? Do you have a contact number? Do you have, is it done through website? You know, there's a series of questions, but everybody cannot have all the answers. But there's a copywriter and a product for each um, each product, uh, each audience there is. So whoever it is, if it's a small business owner, we need to know, okay, what is your product? Who is it meant for? And where are your, your audience base? So 
like I said, WhatsApp is an easy place. Sometimes you go online as well. If your product is maybe, for example, like um, a health benefit, a health medication or supplement, you can go to uh, Facebook, for example, yeah, and talk about it. Um, find creative ways of letting people know that this is available. And now what I see nowadays is I see a lot of people just dumping the products there and just saying this is available. There are no stories. There's no nothing to guide people. So, yes, I see something. Okay, it looks nice. What is it telling me? Nothing. But if, for example, I go to Facebook and I put a post and I say, okay, um, this supplement, this health supplement, uh, there was somebody I know who was struggling with X, Y, Z, maybe the tummy was always running or something of that nature, was always having cramps. And then he took this and then in under maybe 10 days or two or three days, the pain went away. He has, you know, he's now living a more qualitative life, things like that. People begin to identify. Okay, so this product, this is what it does. I should get one too because I know someone. Okay, maybe my grandmother. Okay, maybe my uncle, my auntie has the same problem. Or maybe for just general well being, I don't want this to happen to me. So let me get one as well. So the business of copywriting is every, every uh, business has its own audience. Yeah. Uh, and you design. Uh, what we call a copy for those audiences. In most cases, people tell you website, but website is going to high. Email marketing, sales letters, all those are really high up there for big companies. But for the small scale companies, I like to tell them, go for things like WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp status, go for digital marketing. So places like Facebook, Instagram, uh, where people are, you see, and a lot of people are online. So once you have online presence, it's not 100% that you will always make money, but at least you have a chance and someone who is not even there at all. So you need to find out where people are. And you go there as a copywriter and begin to display, uh, tell them about the product in a very, very sophisticated manner using stories. You know, using, uh, you can even use a headline that is provocative, you see, just for people to look in your direction. And when they look in your direction, you begin to tell them, hey, there's something here, you see, or you get people to just get to know you, you know, um, if people don't know you, they can buy from you. So we always talk about the no like and trust factor. So it may be you, the owner of the business. If it is not you, the owner of the business, you can get somebody who can do it for you. But if you don't have the financial muscle to do that, then you have to find a way to have social media presence, online presence. Where are the people you are looking for? Where are they? And you need to go there to and start to engage with them. If they are talking about maybe politics or they are talking about the economy or things like that, you find a way to make your voice heard. And then you do it gradually so that they become um, comfortable with you. So at the end of the day, when you decide to say, okay, hey, I've got this product, it's not going to be difficult. We call it the no like trust factor. Let people get to know you, let them know you first, and then when they like you, then they trust you to buy from, I mean, to buy from you. So that would just be my suggestion for small business owners. It's much more than this, but you can grasp what I'm saying here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. All right. Now, because we are talking of uh, copy that will convert, which is what you describe as better copywriting or uh, what makes a good copywriting, because that is uh, also my target here in this uh, conversation. Uh, how would you lace emotion into your copywriting so it can convert and therefore become a good copywriter? Okay, you see, the thing, first of all, um, I did talk about some of the KLT strategy, which is a like, sorry, the no like and trust strategy. Um, the first thing is people need to get to know you. So even if you're a copywriter and nobody knows you, it might be difficult, yeah? Um, however, it's not entirely impossible. But how to start is to find, is to gain social presence social presence, let people be visible, let people know who you are. Once people know who you are, at least let them just know, okay, this is Abraham. So, okay, what does Abraham do? You see, 
then you can start creating content to share with them about, for example, now I can give like a seven days content planner. I want to sell a phone, for example. I'm not going to go out immediately and say, come and buy this phone. Nobody's going to answer me. Why? Because they don't know me. So I will start by introducing myself. I can say, okay, my name is Abraham. I do this, I do that. Uh, you know, I do a multitude of things. And I also sell phones. Oh, by the way, I sell phones. I mean, you know, for I don't sell it for a living, but I do it casually. Okay, fine. That's Monday. I've not talked about the sale. Uh, Tuesday, what am I going to talk about? Now okay, I can tell a story about somebody who bought a phone. And maybe what I'm trying to emphasize there is the type of phone that the person bought. Maybe the person bought a phone that the quality wasn't so great. And, but you know, the other person bought a phone that the quality was way better. Just to try and emphasize the importance of buying something that's going to last you longer. That's my objective. Remember, I have not even talked about the sale. On Wednesday, I can say, okay, I'll maybe do a motivation and just say, okay, guys, just to encourage you, you know, um this is midweek um if you're interested in moving yourself forward in life maybe do one or two things i still didn't talk about it for but by the way i did see this phone and look at guys what happened this person owned this owned that um and then he did this he did that you know just to keep the theme of the phone going now notice i have not said anything about the sale i'm just simply talking about myself talking about the story talking about what i observed on the third day on the fourth day i do a throwback the throwback would be maybe i remember those days i remember when gsm came out in nigeria in 2001 and those type of phones just do an old phone versus a new phone 2001 versus 2021 look at the difference you know then on friday by the way, you know, um, there's this promo I'm having. But you see, when you're doing all this, you would see people's reactions. What are people saying? Oh, yes, I remember. Maybe on a Monday, I, I know this. Tuesday, you see people's reactions. By the time you get to Friday, and you now say, oh, by the way, there's a phone that can deal with X, Y, Z. The battery power lasts longer, this, this, that. You know, the internet speed is this, it's that. Um uh, Mr. Okoro bought it recently and it made his life easy. He was able to get one or two gigs with this phone because the customer was able to see information like his website, were able to directly contact him without even asking for the number, things like that. You sell what that phone can do and you tell people, click this link for it now. What do you think is going to happen? They will buy it because you've taken them on a journey yeah, you've taken them on a journey, but you didn't come out guns blazing on a Monday. You just gradually sold your product in a very, very stylish, uh, uh, a very, very dignified way using stories. So stories, like I said, connect with people through emotions. And people, people may not even know that you're doing it, but you, the copywriter, whoever wants to make the sale, you know where you are taking them. But it's a process. So as they get to know you, let them feel comfortable with Abraham wrote the story about X, Y, Z. I liked it. Why did I like it? Because I know somebody or it made me remember somebody I know that had that problem. You see, uh, top of mind awareness has already been created. So sometimes we say you may have to keep um, talking about a particular thing for over seven times before people eventually get to know. Now, in, not in all cases would it be that, okay, because it's now Friday. If maybe, for example, 20 people have been following me and those 20 people are interested in what I have to say, it doesn't necessarily mean that all 20 of them will eventually buy the phone. But at least you get to you get two or three or four that will buy right there and then. And then some probable maybe that will say, OK, fine, do me a follow up. I'm not ready now, but in maybe two or three days. So the follow up continues. Yeah. So that's how I would use stories to sell a product. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Abraham. That has really been very interesting. Uh, now, <laughs> okay. people that are listening to you, they find value in what you're saying and they want to connect with you. So yeah. what is the best way to connect with you? Help them understand how to reach you. And yeah, use the moment to, to advertise yourself. Go ahead. 
Okay, um, if you want to reach me, I am on LinkedIn. Um, just my name, Abraham Oyemari. Um, send me a connection request and I will, I accept all my connection requests. Um, you can also reach me on Facebook, but I am more popular on, on, on LinkedIn because that's where my primary target is. So on LinkedIn, just type, look for Abraham Oyemari, um, send me a request or do a follow. I follow everybody back that follows me. And then you can send me a request and I will respond. Um, if you need a copywriter, you can also reach me. I can help you to draft co uh, a copy that can help whatever product you're selling to convert. And instead of you doing all the, the, the heavy lifting, let me do it for you because I understand how it works. So things like um, website copy, sales letters, all those nice things. Yes, I do those as well. If you are also looking for somebody to... I am also a, a coach. I can teach you a thing or two about being consistent. I'm actually on a, a 365 days consistency challenge right now. And today is 223. So I've got like 42 days more to reach my target. So you can also con connect with me. I can show you the things I have learned and then we can put you up to that as well so that you can begin to get gigs as well if you want to do that and i am also a linkedin coach uh, i also tell you how to optimize your profile because on linkedin the thing is if you want people to see you they need to see your profile first and say okay i like this person i like what this person is writing so i also help people in in the in that regard of linkedin optimization how do you position yourself so that people can see you and know that there's something there so just connect with me on LinkedIn for now. LinkedIn is the main place. I would have loved to drop my number, but hey, I can't do that. But LinkedIn, if you, if you go to my profile, you will see DM to chat with me. You will see there. Just click it. It gives, comes straight to my direct number, and then we can pick up from there. Or you can send me messages. But start with the connections or the follows, and then you can just drop a message. I respond to all my messages. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Now, what would be your final thought here to conclude the conversation that we have had today? Okay, well, I will tell people, regardless of what is going on in life, no knowledge, no activity is wasted. Whatever it is we're doing in life, it's preparing us for something. You may not see what it is immediately, but it will come. So I just want to encourage people, um, know what you want, go for what you want, and don't look in any direction. Be focused on what you want and go for it. And be consistent. If you're going to sell oranges, for example, please sell oranges, yeah? But if you find out that as you're selling oranges down the line, it's no longer working for you. Maybe people are now asking you to sell apples instead. Look at the market and see what is the market telling you. And as long as you have a following that is interested in that product, please go for it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. It has been a pleasure talking with you. I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me. I'm really happy to have given this uh, information and then uh, helping people. Yes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review over here podcast and share with your friends who might need it. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.